Hi, everyone. Welcome to Co-Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Sarah Boston, and this is episode number four. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to this podcast. We have a great one today. I'm speaking to veterinarian Dr. Caroline Brookfield. And our chat, it's honestly just like a couple of old friends, mostly because that's what we are. We're old friends. I have known uh, Caroline since she was a senior veterinary student. She graduated in 1997. And she's had a very interesting career. She's done a whole bunch of different things, both within clinical veterinary practice and then also outside of practice. Uh, She is a stand-up comedian. She's an author. She's a mom and a keynote speaker. And her focus in her keynote talks is creativity. And uh, she's really here to to teach us all uh, that we need to tap into our creative selves. And, you know, maybe you had something that you did in the past that was creative, that made you happy. And then you you stop doing it because you wanted to focus on your career. Well, Caroline's here to tell you to go back and get it, pick it up, because finding your creativity and doing creative tasks, whatever that means to you, is going to make you happier. It's going to make you better at your job and it's going to improve your sex life. Okay, we don't necessarily talk about that, but how can it not improve your sex life being creative? I mean, think about it. All right. While you're thinking about that, also enjoy this talk with Dr. Caroline Brookfield. Well, 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 welcome. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. You said my name right for like the first time since we've ever known each other. I know. I've learned. I can learn. I'm <laughs> old, but I. <laughs> so on that note, we've known each other since 96. 96. How many years is that? I don't do that math. Caroline, who I've called Caroline for over 25 years, who's my friend, was in my husband's class at uh, the Ontario Veterinary College. We just answered that question. When did you graduate? When did you graduate? 1997. Yeah, 97. So you've been a veterinarian for over 25 years. You're also a creative. You're a stand-up comedian. You're a keynote speaker. You're an author. You're a mother. You're lots of things. But uh, why don't we start just by focusing on your career in veterinary medicine? So tell us what you do in veterinary medicine. Why did you become a veterinarian and how has your job changed through the years? When I first went to vet school, I wanted to be a mixed animal vet. Like to the point when I was 18, I went to a tattoo parlor and I wanted a cow tattoo on my bikini line. And the tattoo artist was like, I don't think you want that. I was like, what? And he talked me out of a cow. And then I was like, well, fuck, what am I going to, can I swear on this podcast, by the way? Totally. Yeah. You can totally swear. Yeah. And I was like, it's encouraged. Okay, good. So I was like, well, fuck, what am I going to pick now? So I picked the stupid teddy bear. And after two kids, it does not look like, it looks like a zombie teddy bear. That's my tangential story about I wanted to be a mixed animal vet. And then I wanted to be a zoo vet all through vet school. Like I was like on the fast track. And then I was um, working at a place called White Oak in Florida doing an externship. And they have all these endangered species. I asked the resident who just spent four years of residency, had like an internship or whatever. I was like, where are you applying for a job? She's like, Oklahoma. I'm like, I don't want to live in Oklahoma. So then I say, maybe I don't want to be a zoo vet. So I ended up moving to Florida after I graduated and working in small animal practice and emergency medicine. And then I took a year and a half off to travel. I did some volunteering involving spaying a dog on my front porch in Thailand, which was very bad. It actually went fine and all went well, but you know, I was a bit of a bit of a rebel in those days. And then I moved to Calgary because one of the reasons I didn't want to be a zoo vet is like I wanted to pick where I wanted to live. And I loved Calgary. So I loved to rock climb and mountain bike and be outside. So I moved here and, and started working as a small and locum tenens or a relief vet for our American friends. And uh kind of got bored with that. So I've done a bunch of stuff, Sarah. Like I worked in lab animal. I've worked in wildlife. I did some locums at the zoo. I worked at Nestle Purina as a technical services veterinarian, which is where I actually developed my love for public speaking. And what else have I done? I don't know. I've done, I, like I was, I was helping doing instructing with at the University of Calgary. I don't know. I've kind of done all of it except for a mixed animal practice. <laughs> and a zoo vet. I was a zoo vet. I worked as a zoo vet in Calgary. I had, yeah, when I had a vet leave, I mean, I'm not a board of zoo vet. I didn't so, know that. I worked at the Calgary Zoo for like three months filling in. I darted a lion and sutured her. Like I did all kinds of stuff. You know what people always ask me? There's a couple of things we have in common. Actually, a lot of things we have in common. I also wanted to be a zoo vet. I did a, like a rotation for a month at the Miami Zoo, which cured me of that. But people always ask me, <laughs> 
craziest animal you've ever worked on? So seeing as you were at the zoo, what's the, cra- I mean, lion might be the craziest, but what's the craziest thing you've done or worked on? One of the most memorable was when I came to Calgary and did my externship. So I was a student and here in Calgary, you'll know this bear Scopey and Scopey is one of the grizzlies that still lives at the zoo. And in 1996, which was when I did my externship there, he was in the wild, but he was a problem bear. He was eating grain off the tracks and he was like habituated. And he wandered into the bakery in Lake Louise called Lagans Bakery. And they were like, he's going to die or go somewhere. So the zoo took him and I was an extern at the time. And he showed up at the zoo, like trank to his tranquil eyes. And then he woke up and I remember him eating popcorn and then we anesthetized him. And I put, I put in the Ivy catheter in a grizzly. That was exciting. I couldn't believe I could hit his vein. And uh, we gave him a root canal. Well, we didn't like a dentist gave him a root canal and we gave him a vasectomy. So that was one of the more memorable because he's still at the zoo. So I can still go see him and be like, I helped give you a vasectomy. Wow. A vasectomy. That's interesting that they, well, I don't know. That's interesting. They wouldn't neuter him. I guess they wanted to leave him more natural, more aggressive, more aggression for the captive grizzly bear. That sounds, that sounds <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm probably gonna make people mad. They'll be like, no, because he's in, they want to keep him more his natural state. I'm guessing that's, I guess that's so. why yeah, I think right. vasectomy on a grizzly bear probably wins. That wins most interesting procedure and animal. That's amazing. When I was at the zoo, they were doing some tracking for some rattlesnakes. So I did implant some like GP or they were like radio transmitters and some rattlesnakes. So that was also kind of interesting. Yeah, that's cool. So I think you are a mixed animal vet. That's the thing. I guess Because nothing more mixed than a zoo vet. No. Yeah, but I didn't do it forever. I dabbled. Yeah, you're a dabbler. And that actually brings me to my the question that I didn't answer, which I'm surprised I remembered, is what brought me to vet medicine. And like the science and stuff was there. But I also knew at a young age before, well before I was diagnosed with ADHD, is that I could like do something different with that degree. And if I got bored doing one thing, there's like a million other things I could do with that degree. You knew that? There's veterinarians who've been practicing for years that don't know that. Well, I kind of knew that. But also, it's kind of a long story. I guess you could cut it out if it's boring. But when I was a pre-vet, like when I was in doing my general sciences that you have to do before you apply to vet school... I ran into, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the founders, original founders of Medi-Cal. I was at the gym at the University of Guelph gym doing the circuit. And so it was busy. So you're like in the line to get on the circuit where you like run on the thing and do the weights for 30 seconds. And we were chatting and he's like, oh, well, if you want, I'll tell you like my kind of perception of veterinary medicine. And I was like, that would be great. I'm like 19 or 18 or something. So I go sit in his car, but I'm like, I don't know this guy. So I'm sitting in his car, like with the door open, like ready to bail, you know, because like, who knows, this is like some crazy lunatic, but he wasn't. And he sat down and he drew a picture of veterinary medicine and he put all of the things like research, teaching, industry. This is like 360 of veterinary medicine. And so maybe that was where I was like, oh, you know, I kind of opened my eyes to something more than just a clinical veterinarian. Yeah, maybe he should do a lecture on that instead of taking 18-year-old girls into his car. I don't know. It's just a thought. Maybe. maybe so. <laughs> so currently, like as far as your veterinary work, I know you're doing lots of other work, but your veterinary work is still locum work yeah. in small animal practice. Correct. You've got a quite a broad view of veterinary medicine, but how would you say the profession or the job, whichever you feel more comfortable talking about, like how has that changed over the last 26 years that you've been practicing? Well, some of it's a generational shift away from like, well, I have to work these hours to like, I don't want to work these hours. And like, what? I didn't know we could do that to, yeah. Like I remember when I worked Emerge in Florida, they only wanted to hire two vets. So we basically worked seven days on, seven days off. And at that time, the emergency clinics were closed during the day. So I love the expression. People can't see your expression. You're like, what? I lived it too. It's just so, it's hard to think about. It hurts. Yeah. I know. So like I would go to work at like 5 p.m. on Monday and work till 9 a.m. on Tuesday and then have like nine to five off where I tried to sleep. And then I would do that again until Friday when I got to work at five and I worked till Monday morning at nine. Yeah. Okay. Now people need to see my face because that's ridiculous. Yeah, but we did it, right? Our generation of vets, when we come out, that's just, we're like, oh, that's <laughs> that's just the job, I guess. Well, in the standard of care, you couldn't do that now with the expectation yeah. of standard of care. And the one emergency clinic I worked at in Florida, it was me and this um, guy who had been in the Vietnam War, who was not a tech or anything. He was just trained on the job. And we would just be like, I'd be stabilizing a flip. Like, it's Florida, right? So, you know, you were in Florida. 
you yeah. know, like gunshots and alligator wounds and a lot of trauma. So I've got this flail chest and I've got this cat like having an event from heartworm and I'm just like it was a complete mash unit. Yeah. Okay. So we have some maybe some PTSD from that. <laughs> so I guess in that sense it's changed for the better. Well, I remember in Florida, I remember this case. I remember this dog that came in and it had a GDV and I fixed the GDV and I was really sketchy about the spleen. So I did a splenectomy and the dog had to stay at the clinic because they were going on vacation or something. So it stayed boarding. And I was like, oh my God, are they going to pay their bill? Guess how much it was? It was like $1,500 or $1, something. Bucks. Really? That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. I know, right? I was like, oh, are they going to pay their bill? <laughs> but they were probably like, it was a thousand bucks. You know, mm -hmm. I can't believe it. Yeah. I think it was the biggest bill I'd seen, right? Which really? is the thing. Because I'm doing like, trauma and c-sections and so that's changed yeah and then another thing that's changed is the clients and this is something i talk about a lot i feel like people don't take accountability for their decisions what i mean by that is when i had the dog with the gdv and splenectomy i would probably have been like this is gold standard we'll do this and the fluids and the surgery we could try doing this middle road and see if it works or there's this like kind of cheap approach which i don't know if it'll work or not and people would be like okay i pick B, right? Like they would just take your, like there wasn't the, an internet, which is not necessarily a, a good thing. Like I'm, I think it's good that people are educated and able to research appropriately, but they'd just be like, okay, well, I can't, this is the one I can afford do that one. And if it didn't work out, they'd say, well, you know what? We did our best, you know, that's all we could afford, but that's just what happens. But now people choose like the cheap one. And then if it goes wrong, they don't remember that conversation or they can't take accountability. For, they feel paralyzed with indecision about what works for their budget as well as what they can do for their pet. I don't know if you find that. Yeah, I find that because like, I do cancer medicine. I find like we pick, you know, it's fine. You give options. That's one of the great things about veterinary medicine, I think, compared to the human side is that we can give people options and they're often mostly financially based. But so with my cancer medicine, like we'll pick one and I'll be like, this is going to give you six months or whatever. They come back at six months and, and I'm like, yeah, we're like, now we're done. Like, cause we did that option. <laughs> They're like, well, now what? I'm like, no, now we're done. Yeah. There's no, there's no, what if. now I want the expensive option and it's not available. It can't go back now. Yeah. From the oncology perspective, I kind of hear that and it's heartbreaking, but it's just, it is true. Like we, you know, we kind of have to go back and be like, well, remember we, t we talked about all those things and this is what we decided. And, you know, we can't make them live forever. I wish we could, but we can't. My friend Doug Whiteside, who I think you know, is a zoo vet. Yeah. He says this brilliant line, which I don't think is his, but uh, champagne taste with beer money. Yeah, that's hard. So th you may have answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and because you may have a different perspective. Right now, we're having a lot of challenges in our profession, but for your perspective, what do you think is the biggest challenge in veterinary medicine right now? I think it's like that buzzword, the spectrum of care and communication about it meeting people where they're at i feel like there's very much like uh no offense but a bit of a referral culture right so we have gps feeling like they have to provide specialty level care and the costs that come with it and feeling like they're going to be sued for malpractice if they offer a different level of care than that's available at a specialty level so i feel like there's this conflict between what you want to provide which is the best care and what people can afford mixed in with fear of retribution, whether it's disciplinary action or judgment from your peers. And then also the ambiguity around how is this gonna work out? You know, I had a conversation on LinkedIn with somebody about this about, and they used the example of someone who couldn't afford a TPLO for, for fixing a, a cruciate ligament rupture. So going to a cheaper surgeon for a lateral approach with the, with the whatever, the wire or whatever they use, and it was like, yeah, so the people who that works for are going to be thrilled. They're like, oh, you totally should do that because it's way cheaper and it works just fine. But then you get that one that doesn't work because that's the risk if it's not, if it's going to fail. And they now are like, they forget that conversation and the vet feels like, oh, I should have. We judge our decisions by the outcomes, not by what we knew at the time. So I think yeah. that's a challenge is feeling confident in offering options without this fear of retribution, whether it's from our colleagues or other or clients or and just trying to help people with their pets, which is really what it's all about. What we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, we're a judgmental bunch. I, I don't I don't I try not to judge. And it's gotten really expensive, which is which is very challenging, I think. 
All right. So more on the more positive side, because you're still practicing as a veterinarian. What do you like the most about being a veterinarian? I like the diversity and the challenge. As I get older, I found that more difficult. Like I found that I was a little bit more up for challenges when I was younger. Now, I think, you know, you get schooled a few times, so it's harder to, to be bold. But I love the diversity of it. I love the people in the profession because they're good, good people who really want to make a difference. And, you know, sometimes I get to hang out with puppies and kittens. That's my favorite part. I'm not going to lie. During the pandemic, just I just hung out with puppies and kittens. <laughs> I loved it so much. I mean, I still do, but that's definitely my fave part of being a veterinarian. Hands down. I like you. I like surgery. I'm, I like to do yeah. surgery. But as a locum, it's more difficult because your case selection is a bit harder. Yeah, for sure. I'm locuming right now, too. So, yeah, I hear that. Okay, so now I'm going to pivot to stand-up comedy. Pivot. We're pivoting. <laughs> you said something to me a little while ago, You and I don't know, you can correct me if this is not how you see yourself, but because I know you're also a keynote speaker and you speak about creativity. And you said, well, I see myself as a keynote speaker who does stand-up rather than a stand-up comedian who does keynote. So can we start with just maybe speaking to that a little bit, and then I want to get into the stand-up a bit more? Well, I think I say that because uh, I love comedy, and when I don't do it for a while, it's hard to get started like anything there's an inertia but when I go and do some comedy I think oh this is so much fun I want to do this all the time but I also don't want to be in a bar seven nights a week doing five minutes of work so I'm kind of lazy like I just don't think I want to put in the effort that I think it would take or maybe it's a fear of success that's a whole thing I deal with of trying to break into such a difficult industry and I'm also a little bit of a princess and comedy doesn't pay very much. And keynote speaking has a much more direct path to revenue. It's very difficult as well and it's challenging, but I feel like the keynote speaking can combine my love for comedy as well as my love for education and my passion for helping people find that unique spark in themselves that can help them feel happy. All right. Can you talk a bit about, I haven't heard someone say fear of success before. Maybe that's a thing and I just don't know, but Okay, well, for you, what is it? What does that mean? So fear of success would, for me, be, let's say I'm afraid of success as a stand-up. Well, now I'm traveling all the time, and I'm on TV, and people are criticizing me, and I don't have control of my own time because I have an agent who's booking me here, there, and everywhere and sending me to Siberia for a comedy tour. Like, maybe I don't want to do that. I think it's a lack of control. So my fear of success is um, if the success, which is probably flawed, and that's something I have to evaluate with my therapist, I think it's more around a lack of control, which is why I've always been a locum and I've always felt very strongly about keeping control of my life, which is one of the reasons I decided not to be a zoo vet, right? Yeah, it sounds awful if you had to have an agent who booked you in on a tour and you got a Netflix special. That would be terrible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm so afraid of that. <laughs> But I told you it was a flawed. Like, yeah, um, so we're all a little flawed. That's fine. In some degree, I do understand what you mean. I think there's a tremendous amount of effort to kind of make it as a stand-up. And also, the current path is there's a lot of nights and bars. And so for Gen X or, you know, women, I think that there is an additional layer of challenge for that because I'm not up at that time. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then there's like, I mean, people have been very kind to me in the community, but it's a younger crowd. It's a male crowd. It's a bro -y crowd. So, you know, I think there's sometimes that's a bit challenges that I face anyway. So I'm sure it's similar for you. Yeah, absolutely. Like we're just talking about straight stand up comedy and maybe we've answered already. But what do you think is the biggest challenge about it or difficulty? Probably the self motivation to maintain that momentum, like to actually reach out to a producer and be like, hey, especially when you don't know, I and mean, we all kind of get those rooms that we're more comfortable with, and be like, hey, can I be on your show? And I'm like a 51-year-old like white woman, and it's like a 22-year-old guy. It's funny, because I don't mind getting up and get, telling my jokes, but the reaching out to producers and trying to get a spot and networking, that can be hard. And you just think, eh, do I really want to do this? Because maybe that's that whole thing we're talking about. Like, I don't see myself as being a Netflix special comedian. And maybe that's a mindset thing. It's just the like, oh, I got to write some jokes. You know, like it's that self-motivation because there's really nobody cares if you write a joke or get up on stage. Like nobody really cares except for you. No, I, I can hear that. 
but you still do stand up. So what do you like? The, like, why do you do it? What is the thing about stand up that you like the most that keeps you going back? Well, I mean, people laughing is, is great. I like to do things that are different. And it's really fun to be completely outside of your sphere of what you're used to being in. Like, the people we hang around with in stand up clubs, Sarah, are not the people we hang around in a vet clinics. Getting yourself out of your comfort zone and getting out of your zone of expertise and being a beginner again, because you're a specialty surgeon, like high level instructing. After a while with your profession, you're just like, you become complacent. You rest on your laurels as like, well, I'm good at this. So being deliberately bad or learning something new is a challenge for me. All right. I love that. So when did you first start doing stand-up comedy and, and how did you get into it? And, and also why? <laughs> <laughs> like what was your path because I don't even actually don't know this about you when exactly did you start what was that process I think it was 2015 I don't remember so the process was I'd always been interested in arts and performance and in high school I loved drama and acting and photography and then went to vet school and obviously had to put that all to the side while I was doing vet school stuff and trying to be a vet and then I felt like I was kind of missing something. So I went back and took some acting classes and really liked that. And um, I'd been doing some improv here in Calgary with a group, just like informally for many years, even before I had kids. So that would have been like in the early 2000s. And then I had a website. So I had a couple of online businesses. And that's not really important, except for to say that I had a business coach. And her name was Kelsey Ramsden. Her name is Kelsey Ramsden. That was. She did all like the coachy stuff that you do, like, you know, what are the things you like and blah, blah, blah. So it was like a lot of exploration, personal exploration stuff. And through that, I said sometime, like, I kind of always wanted to do stand up comedy. And it just kind of came out, kind of always been on my bucket list, like really just in the background. And then I hung up from that call and I just Googled stand up comedy lessons Calgary. And lo and behold, there was a class that had already started. And so I emailed the instructor and said, hey, I wanted to join the class, but I see you've already had a class. And he said, no, we actually had to delay it a week. So you're in. So I took that class. Then the rest is history. Wow, it's very serendipitous. I know you're a little bit nerdy like me. I mean, that is a compliment. No. <laughs> <laughs> so did you do more than one class? Did you study it? Did you or did you just do the class and then start going up? It was like a six week class. So through the six weeks, we kind of built a set. And at the end, we quote unquote, graduated and did like a set at this funny fest festival that was on. And I knew I was very conscious of the fact that if I didn't book more comedy immediately, I would never do it again. So I went out and said, Oh, how do I get on this? And how do I get on that? And just kind of built built it from there. And, you know, through COVID, I think I did comedy like once or twice. And I do it in spurts, like sometimes I'll do like three or four sets in a month, and then nothing for a few months. It just really kind of depends on my schedule and um, and the self-motivation and what's available as well. Yeah. Did you do Zoom comedy or not? No. No. All right. <laughs> no, I haven't yet to find someone who found that enjoyable. So at that time, I was more focused on my keynote speaking, I think. Which oh, is that's true. And you did that over Zoom. And I don't feel like I was at the level. I, maybe that, like it's all like this, you know, self-concept or maybe not, not imposter syndrome, but I was like, well, I'm not good enough to do Zoom comedy. Like I didn't feel like I was... No one is, Caroline. True. No one is. Even like, I don't want to name names, make enemies, but I would listen to people who are like seriously famous stand up comedians doing Zoom comedy. And I'm like, oh, it's they're not doing it e well either. <laughs> so I think I'll stop. So you did some, just stopped after a while? I did some and then I stopped. I think there's some people who are good at it, but I, do, I think it's a different art form. That's sort of what I concluded. Yeah. And I think you need very polished jokes that you know kill already. It's not good for trying out a joke. No, because you have no feedback, right? Hey everyone, I just want to give a quick shout out to our exclusive title sponsor, Hills Pet Nutrition. They are just a fantastic nutrition company for pets. Uh, they have a new diet out called Onc Care, and I'm a veterinary surgical oncologist, so I treat pets with cancer. I also had a dog that I lost uh, to cancer. His name was Rumble. People who know <laughs> my story with Rumble, how difficult that was. And at the time, it was really hard to know what to feed him. So this is a new diet for animals with cancer. Uh, it's very digestible. It's got a high nutritional content and it is very good for their microbiome. So I really wish this diet had been out uh, when I was going through my journey with Rumble, but definitely something that's great to have available. 
So thank you, Hills, for everything you do. And thank you for being a sponsor. I just have so much gratitude for your help. Uh, We really couldn't do this podcast without you. So you do stand up. I know when you're speaking at a conference, sometimes people think you're you're there to do stand up, but you're actually there to do keynote speaking, which is it's different. And we'll get into that. But you've done some stand up for veterinary professionals. And then you do some at comedy clubs in Calgary. Is that right? Yeah, we did that one in Edmonton together. I haven't done a lot for veterinarians um, other than the, oh, you're funny. Tell a joke, you know, when you're like, you know, you love that thing. But yeah, and mostly it's comedy clubs. I've done a comedy club in San Diego. Uh, I've done like across Canada. I've been to Ottawa. Um, but it's mostly open mics and some um, booked engagements. I had one for the first time about a month ago in a small club, which was exciting. I did like 22 minutes or something. Awesome. Awesome. How'd it go? It was terrible. Yeah. Oh, good. Great. <laughs> I'm, so glad I, I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> it was a small club and it was in like a basement of a, like I've done this club before and it's, it's well produced and the person who runs it is amazing. There was a concert a few doors and I hate to tell a story because I don't want to be that comedian. It's like the audience was shit, you know, because people sometimes do that. And that's just a, I, I try not to do that. But the mitigating factors, I suppose, were that there was a larger crowd, but a bunch of them left right before I started headlining. Of course, you know, like the other comedians, they all leave as soon as their set's done. So like the crowd thinned out. Yeah, it was a lot of other comics left, you know, and a couple of people who were all like, not my demographic and but you know what i did get a heckler actually but the heckler was from upstairs there was an upstairs patio and then stairs down to the basement and someone from upstairs who wasn't even listening to the show just yelled down where's the punchline i think just trying to be funny and i was like well there's one coming like it didn't phase me because i was like i have a punchline just wait (laughs) so you know i guess you know that was learning experience and you know what they listened they were listening they weren't just like it's not like they were just in their own conversations completely ignoring me i've had that happen before but i got through my set and so in that way it was a success but it was not too roaring laughter well i always find when i do comedy i just try to take even if it's not a good night i just try to take one good thing you'd headlined and you got through your set right and i handled the heckler i continued my set it wasn't like i got thrown off by the heckler do you have you had a lot of hecklers no have you no no i don't i don't know i don't get a ton i don't know i don't know why maybe it's because we're middle-aged ladies i don't really know why i i i sort of wonder because you know in in school they taught us about how to deal with hecklers and stuff and i'm like okay i'm ready but it's not an invitation (laughs) it's not an invitation for anyone to come and heckle me but i haven't dealt with it a lot uh, which i guess i'm grateful for that yeah, I had one when I was in Ottawa, there was a heckly, heckly lady at the front, like not just to me, to everybody. And I took a little bit of it, but just kind of ignored. I think you shut it down pretty quick. If you just kind of ignore them and like not in that, I have never had like a yelly, like you suck heckler or anything like that. Um, more like the people who are trying to contribute their own point of view to your set. Yeah, I, it's funny when you see people come and they sit right in the front and they want to they want to be a part of it. And it it's cool in a way. And then it's also awful <laughs> well it's like get on stage then if you have something to say get on the freaking stage yeah for sure i did have one i had a heckler when i was in Kelowna, and that's where i met belina who is the tech that we know she was intoxicated and randomly said something about oh sphincter she's like what do you think about sphincters and she was trying to be all happy i'm like well what kind of sphincter are you talking about an anal sphincter or a urinary sphincter like the lower esophageal sphincter <laughs> And she's like, what? <laughs> that's a good response. Yeah. That's yeah, it's a good response. Dude, you're bringing your medical knowledge in to silence a heckler. Yes. With your, your anatomy. You anatomied them. <laughs> it reminds me of that anatomy class we had uh, first year where everybody lost half a point because, you know, they had the organs that you had to identify and everybody put bladder, but because you didn't put urinary bladder. Oh, you know, really? You lost a point. I'm like, that's stupid. Oh, my God. That's very pedantic. Welcome to veterinary medicine, you know, right? <laughs> where people can be very pedantic. All right. It's time to jump to your clip. So uh, you said this is one of the first jokes you wrote. And I, I think it's interesting because you're incorporating veterinary medicine in your jokes right away. Okay. So here is you in, where were you? Airdrie. <laughs> uh, and we're just going to jump to your clip right now. from Best School in Ontario and I thought I want to do something different. I want to go somewhere like Canada, only warmer. So I went to Florida. 
Yeah, just like Canada only warmer. But what was great about there is that they love their veterinarians down there. I just felt so appreciated. I went to a party and I met this guy. And he's like, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a vet. And he stops and he looks at me with a tear in his eye and he says, thank you for your service. (laughs) Wow. Okay, so this same thing happened. I lived in Florida and this happened to me all the time. It is actually in the States. People get a bit upset if you say vet because there's like veterans. And if you say vet, that is supposed to be for veterans and they do get upset with you. So we're supposed to say veterinarian. Maybe that was the problem. I didn't know that. Well, but I would say veterinarian and people still thank me for my service. And then I would say, no, I'm a, I'm a veterinarian. And they would be like, yes, thank you, ma'am. And then at that point, I just, I would just say, you're welcome. I didn't know if they really knew what I was saying. No, probably not. Like, I was 24 years old when I went down there. I had someone say to me, I'm like, they're like, oh, what do you do or something? I said, I'm a vet. And they said, what war? So I do a joke about that as well. And I'm like, the war against pet overpopulation? Like, what yeah. what war? But I guess they could have been like in, you know, in the Gulf or something. I don't know. They respect their, well, to a point, they respect their veterans, except the ones who don't have health care. And, you know, those they- ones. But- <laughs> <laughs> but, they talk the talk, but they don't walk yeah, the walk, maybe. They do, which I, I, you know, I think that's a good thing to respect veterans um, right, yeah. and veterinarians. But yeah, it is, com- it's very confusing. I don't know. One of us maybe needs to change. <laughs> One of us maybe needs to make a change about what we call ourselves. But that is challenging. So I want to talk to you a little bit. I know you said that was an early joke. And that was kind of a, like a situational joke. But I know you're quite structured in the way you... You like to write a joke because when we've talked about jokes, you're very, I find you very structured. Yeah, like, because you're always like, well, what's your premise and what's this? And so, I mean, maybe you don't see yourself that way, but if you can, can you talk to that a little bit about at least your process of when you're writing a joke? How are you doing that? Like, do you take notes or, yeah, I just want to hear about how you write jokes. Yeah, I remember we talked about that. And I think part of that is that I was trying to put more structure into my joke writing to make it more, to make it better and learn, you know, I like to do it right. I like to do things right. You know, I'm a Gen X veterinarian. Like I like, Same. It. am I doing this right? Am I, doing this correctly? <laughs> am I winning? Are am we I winning? winning? <laughs> am I winning at joke writing? So <laughs> I'm really bad at the premise, actually. I know that we talked about that, but I think it's because I struggle with that, like what the premise is. So when I write a joke, like if I'm starting from scratch, a lot of times, like I have uh, like the notes app on my phone, or I have a notebook, I'll just scribble down something and you know, it could be I'm listening to another comedian or I'm walking down the street. Like one of the premises that I haven't written a joke about yet, but I was standing in Tim Hortons. Anybody in the U.S. listening, it's a coffee shop. What the hell is with these menus that like flap around? I'm like, I think I wanted, what? Oh, it's gone. And they're like, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. I have to wait now until, and then there it is. And oh, oh, but it's gone already. Like, holy shit. So I was doing that and I try to be observant about like ridiculous things. So that yeah. I was like, this is ridiculous. And then remembering to write it in my book and then sitting down and thinking like, well, what's funny about that? And putting some of the structure that I, you know, I've learned and you probably learned as well. Like, am I doing a list? Am I doing like one of the things I was taught was to think the opposite. So if you hate that, then how can you love that? Like, I love it because, you know, whatever the reason is. So I try to just put some type of emotion or, context around it what do they call that i don't know they call it something i forget like you're living in the moment i think because it's like whatever you can see on the menu at the time when you get up there that's what you're gonna get yeah 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 so like what's the premise the premise is like you have a menu you can't read i guess maybe that's the premise and then what's your feeling about it like it's stupid or it's hilarious or it's annoying and then what makes it funny and that's where things like i do a lot of comparison like what is it like it would be like like a flapping menu like that would be kind of like a Russian roulette at the doctor or go to a dentist and you don't know which dentist you're seeing. You just go in some random door. Like, like, what is it like? Like, what is seeing those menu things flash by? I try to feel like, what does that remind me of? And what can that be like? And then how can I tie those two together in a ridiculous way? The person who I love that does this, and actually it's funny, I don't watch a lot of comedy, but the example that comes to mind, which might be a little bit easier because it's already a joke, is Jim Gaffigan does this joke about fashion models on the runway and how they're like teenagers looking for food in the kitchen. And he kind of walks out like, it's, yeah, you're laughing because it's hilarious. 
but to combine two things to be like, yeah, this is like that. And then the person goes, oh yeah, it is like, oh my God, that's hilarious. So that's kind of what I try to think of like, what does this remind me of something that is so completely far away from this experience that it would be funny. I'm going to think about that for the rest of this podcast. Good. And then tell me. I'll see if it comes to me. <laughs> it comes to you. All right. I think I'm pivoting again because I, I want to get into your real passion, which I know something that you're like, I know you love comedy, but comedy, what led you to? I mean, I don't even know what you're speaking about creativity because it's more than just your speaking. I mean, your whole it's kind of like your whole jam right now is getting into creative mindsets and being a creative. So can you just talk a little bit about what led you to that? And like, I don't even know. I don't want to put a label on it because I don't even know if I can. But how would you kind of explain that to everyone? You could put a label on it. Just don't make it like toggle through a bunch of different labels. So then I don't have to pick one. Okay, well, I'm going to call you a creative and then have you explain that. I was trying that. to link the idea of the Tim Hortons menu to like the label, like the <laughs> toggling for a label. Oh, Whatever sorry, label I didn't get it. to be on my head at the moment. I was like, did I just say something wrong? <laughs> no, no, I was trying to make a joke. Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> funny. See, oh, this okay. is the joke writing process and this is the creative process is being okay, being really bad at something, you know, like it's, you have to get through the really bad stuff to get to the good stuff. So, yes. okay, wait, what was your question about me becoming a because to me, I think you are, you're, when I think about what you're doing, like other than veterinary medicine, and I think about, oh, what's Caroline doing? It's about creativity and, and it's kind of an umbrella and stand up fits under that keynote speaking, writing. But what led you to that, I guess, to be, to getting into just the whole, the subject matter of creativity? What led you to get into that? Yeah, I think it all stems from one of the things I think about people is that we are not a creme caramel, we are baklava with many, many layers. Mm. So with that preface to say that I have many, many layers that have conspired together in my midlife to put those things together. So I've got my love of performance and drama and, and photography and creativity that I kind of left aside in high school and have reconnected with through stand up comedy through my performance. And then I had my job, uh, my corporate job, where my job was to speak to people. And I loved it. And everyone's like, everybody hates it. I'm like, well, and through trying to figure out kind of what I want to do with my life when I'm 40, it's like, oh, well, if I love it and everybody else hates it, then maybe I should do that. And so those are kind of two separate but similar things. And then, you know, doing the stand up gave me so much enjoyment and thrill. And I just love doing it. And I thought, well, I want to speak to people, but not through a corporate lens. But what am I going to talk to people about and who am I going to talk to about? So first I started speaking to veterinarians about hiring and being a locum or a relief vet. So I was like, well, I had an employment agency for 10 years, like connecting. So I'm like, I'm like, quote unquote, an expert in being a, a locum. But then I realized I'm not passionate about that. It's a small market. Nobody pays. And I don't make to make a million dollars. But, you know, if I'm spending all this time developing something that's a quality product, I need to be compensated for it. So otherwise my husband's going to kick me out. So, so I guess it's just many things that conspire together. And then I, I started wondering about like, why is creativity giving me so much joy and what is creativity anyway? And I didn't think of it as creativity. I was like, why, why does doing like stand up and acting, why does that make me feel good? And I think one of the moments was um, when I was working at a vet clinic and I worked there like every once a month or something. And I had always been embarrassed to tell people about my jewelry business because I thought they would think, that's so weird. Like, why are you doing a jewelry business when you're a vet? But then I stopped caring. I was like, whatever, I don't care what people think. So I told them about jewelry business. And then a month later, I came back and they were like, you know, you had that talk about your jewelry business. And I thought it was weird, but then I thought it was so cool. And it reminded me of like the quilting I used to do and how I, I loved quilting. And I, I realized, why did I stop doing that? I just kind of stopped and I started again. And now I've been having so much fun and I'm having like, I have something to look forward to at the end of the day. And I thought, is that going on for everybody? And the more I met people, the more it was like, I love to do this, but I don't do it anymore. And it was always something creative. So then I dove into, as you would, as a researcher, and I still had my access because I was taking a certificate at the UFC. So I had PubMed access. I like downloaded hundreds of articles peer reviewed on applied creativity, everyday creativity and the benefits. And I was like, what? Why doesn't anybody know this? 
And so that was the catalyst for the keynote speaking. No, it's cool. So you know, we have a lot of healthcare professionals listening, and I don't know if you can do it in a nutshell. They might have to just read your book, but in a nutshell, <laughs> as much as you can, what is applied creativity? How can it help healthcare professionals or other professionals, you know, just by kind of trying to dig into their creative side? Because I think that's a lot of what this podcast is about, even though it's focused on comedy, but a lot of science brains who maybe left music or acting or something, we left it behind. What's the benefit of trying to bring that part of us back? Yeah, and I love that you position it that way instead of saying like for people who aren't creative, because we are all creative in our own unique way. But what happens is kind of that curse of knowledge, like we were talking about before, we get so good at our profession or what we know that we feel uncomfortable going somewhere where we're not an expert anymore. And creativity is a practice of stepping into uncertainty, facing failure, getting up and doing it again, which is kind of resilience. Because anytime you do something creative, whether you're writing a joke or you're painting a canvas or you're, you know, even creating a pivot table in Excel, like you don't know how it's going to turn out until you start doing it. And it's that uncertainty that can be very disarming for people who are used to having certainty. And I think that's why creativity gets put by the wayside as well as like life and work. And it seems unimportant and frivolous, but we all have something creative, even if we're not artistic. And I think that comes down to the definition, which, you know, from a research standpoint, they call it big C and little C creativity or small C or mini C creativity. So big C would be like the iPhone, the Mona Lisa, you know, Jim Gaffigan's pale special. Small C would be things like um, this podcast you're doing. So it's very creative. It's maybe not disruptive in its domain and recognized by its peers, which defines large C, big C creativity. But it's something very creative. And even something else that could be creative is even just making, throwing some paprika in a meal, choosing the scarf to go with your outfit, designing your desk in such a way that it's more efficient. Those are all things that are creative. All right. Yeah. So as far as the benefits go, so the definition of creativity is important. I think we don't have something in our language that defines artistic creativity from the everyday creativity, which is what I talk about. The benefits are incredible, like peer reviewed research shows that it makes you happier. Making a meal, something simple, choosing your outfit, those are all things that make us happier the next day. And the mechanism is very interesting, um, which I know you're a nerd, self-proclaimed nerd. It's through problem solving. So we get enjoyment out of creativity because we're solving a problem. Like how do I reproduce that tree on a canvas? Or how do I get this pivot table to do what I want? And we get a dopamine hit from solving those problems. So it's like an artificial way to get happiness from closing the loop. And from a, an individual level, it makes us happier. It gives us better job performance, better satisfaction. Creatives have, like people who say they feel like they're creative have higher salaries. And then from an organizational perspective, it increases job performance and satisfaction, team cohesion. Uh, people who think they're using their creativity are half as likely to be looking for a new job. Like I could go on and on, Sarah. I mean, tell me when to start. Okay, I'm just taking issue that you think my podcast is small c, but that's okay. It currently is small c, <laughs> maybe it'll be big c. Just wait. It's not mini c, <laughs> it's small c. I think it's medium c. Medium c. Caroline. Oh, yeah, medium c. it's medium c. <laughs> it's medium c. So, okay, you have like hour long keynote talks on this, so it is hard to kind of condense it. But if someone was listening right now who is a healthcare professional and is curious about comedy, or maybe they're not, but they're curious about you know, they played piano to a high level in grade 12, but then they had to leave it because, you know, a lot of us were trying to pursue being a doctor, being a veterinarian, and you basically are told you don't have time for that because you don't actually. So now someone's older, they're in their profession, and they're kind of missing that part of themselves. Like, what, what's your advice to those people? I think the thing that holds people back is what I, you know, I mentioned the uncertainty, but also this fear, uh, fear of failure, fear of judgment. And what I would say is that you know this, Sarah, more than anybody. Nobody gives a shit about what you do anyway. They don't. I could get on stage if the 20-year-old doesn't think my joke about menopause is funny. Who cares? I'm not going to die. But we feel judgment like physical pain. And it stops us from expressing our originality and, and sharing our unique gifts with the world because we're afraid of people judging us because it hurts. And... The top regret, like Bronnie Ware's book, The Top Regrets of the Dying, is 
living a life that others expected of you. So creativity as a part of living a life that is true to who you want to be and knowing that you don't have to be good at the creative outlet that you choose to even get the benefits of it. So just do it. Get over yourself. No one gives a shit. We all want to win. All the nerds want to win. We want to win that's at it. comedy. That's it. And that's why <laughs> I think we're so, we're so, especially in healthcare, we're so programmed to be great. And I mean, I'm going to be an armchair psychologist here, but we validate our worth in a lot of cases by our capacity and our definition of self of being a healthcare professional. Like I am a veterinarian. That makes me immediately someone who's worthy. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Yeah, I've been amazed actually because I, I didn't, come out as a comedian for a while and then I started telling people and they were like that's so cool that's the that's the most common thing that someone says to me if I tell them what I'm doing right now and I was like wow everyone's just gonna be like you know Sarah's cracked up she's having a midlife crisis and I maybe I am I don't care I just don't care anymore but most people just go that's so cool I wish I could do something like that so yeah I don't really know what I'm doing I'm just doing it but you know what? So what I find is like that jewelry story I told you about where people said, oh, I, I may get, because what you do matters. It, I, I say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to like, you're not going to change being a doctor or a veterinarian. You're still going to be that part of yourself, but you're just adding more layers of baklava. And when I say it doesn't, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. But what you're doing, Sarah, is it matters because you're showing people that you are baklava and not creme caramel. And they're like, oh, well, maybe I have a bit of baklava in me too. And it might not be stand-up comedy, but maybe it's quilting or maybe it's uh, singing. I had someone join a choir after we spoke. Maybe it's painting Warcraft things or drawing. You know, there's so many different things that we put by the wayside. And what you're doing is showing to people that it's possible. It's contagious. Creativity is contagious. So I am so excited about your podcast because I know that people are going to hear this and get that little glimmer of something that lift them up when they were a kid or, you know, when they were in high school that they thought, why don't I do that anymore? Oh, I love that. Maybe people can tell us what they're doing. So, OK, I you could go on and on about this. And you did. And you wrote a book. As we are starting to wrap up, can you just tell people like how to find you? And also, can you just tell everyone a little bit about your book, The Reluctant Creative? Yeah. So in COVID, as I was trying to build a business as a keynote speaker to large audiences, I decided to write a book. I named it The Reluctant Creative because it's really a book and it talks about five effortless habits that I condense from both my experience doing stand up and, and speaking, as well as the research I've like devoured over the years. And so there are five easy habits for anybody to start engaging more with their creativity because you can't throw a stick without reading an article about how we need innovation and creativity. But some people don't know how to access it. And so I call it the reluctant creative because people are like, well, I know I should be creative, but like, ah, that's the book. And I tried to make it funny and light, but also helpful with some actionable takeaways. Okay, that's amazing. So if anyone's listening right now and they're like, I don't know how to do this, but I really am into it and I got to... I really felt like it woke up a side of my brain, <laughs> which was cool. Like, I, I, you know, when I started doing stand up, like I felt like this part of my brain was kind of dormant and I kind of woke it up. So now I feel like I feel like both sides of my brain are firing again, which is cool. So if you're listening and you're like, I want to wake up my other side of my brain, too. One way to do that is is get Caroline's book and uh, hopefully that will help you now. There's exercises in the book. I wrote exercises after each chapter. So. Okay, it's good. It's good for the nerds because we need structure. <laughs> we can't just go be creative. We need to know how to do it and how to win. So, so this it's is not like about how to be creative. It's about how to engage the habits that welcome your creativity that you already have. So it's about welcoming in existing creativity, not about building something. Okay, that's cool. Oh, yeah, no, it's a good distinction because it is true. People will be like, I'm not creative. And I know you don't like that. It's like, no, everyone's creative. It's just whether you're kind of nurturing that side of yourself or not. It's a skill. I think it's made me a better veterinarian, like kind of exploring that side of myself. So, but have you ever like done that thing where you're like, oh, wait, I'm not at a stand up and you say something to clients and you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, all I, did, the time. I had one where it was a, a dog that came in and she had like an infection around her vulva and the pri prior vet had like shaved the area to keep it clean and stuff, but it was like moving. So I was like, well, I guess we should just like shave the whole area so it's easier to access. I said, well, just give her a Brazilian. And it was like 60 year old man. And he just kind of went, 
like looked at me with these big eyes. I was like, probably shouldn't have said that. But do you ever get? Yeah, no, that's definitely happened to me that I, my clients are often Googling me all the time. And so they, they're kind of cool with it. I don't know, but I try not to make it a show, but yeah, they definitely are. They kind of, they kind of know a lot of them have read my book and they come in and they're like, so I'm just like, okay, these people know what they're getting, I guess. That's fine. How do people find you? Uh, well, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn under my name, Caroline Brookfield. Um, if you're interested in the book, there's a website. It's thereverlictingcreative.com. Or you can check out my website, which is just my name, carolinebrookfield.com. Okay. And we're going to put all that information in our show notes so people can find you and find your book. Yeah. And you can get a link to my newsletter. It's a download with the activities from my book. So if you don't want to buy the book and you just want to check out what the activities are all about, we can put that link in if, if you're interested and um, people can access that. Okay. That would be amazing. I hope people are going to do this. And then I want people to go on my Instagram and Caroline's Instagram and let us know what you're doing. <laughs> Whether it be comedy or creativity, we want to know what you're doing. Take a photo of you doing it and tell us what you did and why and how you learned about it on Sarah's podcast. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I would love it. I would love that. We got to talk about, he doesn't really call himself Dr. Ken Jung, but I'm going to call him that because he's a doctor. Is it Jung? I don't know his name. You know, as you know, I like to pronounce people's name incorrectly, so I may be. And that's probably not going to help me get him onto the podcast. It's probably going to hinder that request. But if you could speak directly to Dr. Ken Jung, he is a physician who does not practice anymore, who is obviously a famous comedian now. And I really want him to come on my podcast. And that's when I will become a big C creative. You are speaking to Ken <laughs> right now. Can you please invite him to come on my podcast? Ken, Ken, this is the ghost of comedy past. You are going to regret if you don't come on Dr. Sarah Boston's podcast and share your wisdom with the world. Because really, what harm could it do? Did you die? I see. I have a mug with that on it. But did you die? That's but did you die? Oh, that's and the line from Hangover. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, so that was good. A, I didn't even know that. Yeah, there's a scene where they all do something and they think he's dead. And then he shows up the next day and they're like, you know, dude, we've had this rough day and it's been really tough. Like, cut, to, cut us, cut us a, some breaks or whatever. And he's like, yeah, but did you die? <laughs> and so I do that for my creativity. But did you die? Because, you know. No one died. Or did anyone die? Or did any animal die? No. Then it's an okay day. <laughs> and Ken you will not die if you come on Sarah's podcast. No, it'll be fun, Ken. Just just do it. It'll be amazing. Bring the Kenergy. <laughs> That's a different Kenergy. But yeah, we want some Kenergy. My husband's name's Ken. So maybe it could be all of the Kens you know on the podcast. Bring in some Kens. <laughs> this, is the, this is my... This is my goal. This is the goal of the podcast. <laughs> Ken Jung, come on. All right. Well, Caroline Brookfield, thank you so much for spending time with me. It's been amazing having you on the podcast. And I hope you've inspired some people to explore another part of their brain. And that's it. That's my podcast. <laughs> that's your podcast. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so thrilled to be on here. And I love seeing what you're doing. And you're hilarious. And I'm so excited to see this podcast. And I can say I was one of the early guests when you have Ken Jung on your podcast. Exactly. I Exactly. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. I'm Dr. Sarah Boston, and we've been talking to Dr. Caroline Brookfield about all things creative, including stand-up comedy and veterinary medicine. Thank you. And that wraps up this episode of Co-Medicine. I've been Dr. Sarah Boston. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I just want to give a big shout out to our exclusive title sponsor, Hills Pet Nutrition, for helping to make this podcast possible and for supporting veterinarians and initiatives like this. I uh, really literally couldn't do it without you. I want to thank uh, musical genius and stand-up comedian Mark Edwards uh, for making music that somehow makes me laugh. I don't know how he does it. Uh, please check out his info in his show notes. He is a stand-up comedian and actor. Um, he's absolutely hilarious. And big thank you to my producer, Heather McPherson from Twisted Spur Media, who just seems to make everything work and everything sound great. And I also couldn't do this podcast without her. Thank you for listening. I hope you're having as much fun as I am. That might actually be hard because I am obsessed with this podcast. 
If you enjoyed the podcast, please let us know, let your friends know, give us likes and nice comments, do all the things, help support this new podcast. Uh, If you didn't enjoy this podcast, I don't know what you're still doing here. You know what? If you didn't enjoy it, you can just do nothing. Nothing would be good. Uh, We will see you next episode. Thank you.